All right, how is everyone? Good, how about yourself? Pretty good, thank you. So any questions as far as what we've been doing up to this point? How many people are either done with or confident that they will soon be done with program two? Excellent. Okay. Um, if not, or even if, um, if there's questions about that, feel free to ask now or during uh, the first break. Um, I feel like most people are in good shape on that. I have a question about the default values okay. that we used. Um, <clears throat> so if you just type in wherever your variable is equals zero, is mm -hmm. that, that doesn't always set that variable to zero, that's just your default value, is that how that works? That sets it to zero at that moment, okay. right? But if you change it, it'll take on whatever value okay. it takes on. Um, So after you say x equals x plus 1, x will definitely be equal to 1. Okay. So it's really just an initialization, and it's exactly the same thing as doing this. All right, okay. Declaring x to be a variable and then saying x equals 0. It's just an assignment at that point in the program. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing that isn't always said explicitly, but is really important is that what you see in your program is executed sequentially, right? Generally from the beginning to the next line to the next line. Um, and so here's something that I've occasionally seen people do. So you say y equals x plus 1 to try to set y to be one more than the value of x. And then let's say we set x equal to 5. And you say, what's the value of y now? And it's whatever the value of x was in the beginning plus 1, right? I've occasionally encountered students who believe that when I say x equals 5, y is now equal to 6, right? Because I said y is 1 more than x. And that actually works in some paradigms. There's a thing called reactive programming. And in a reactive programming language, that's exactly what would happen. Um, Engineering 250, we talk a little about a hardware language called Verilog. If we wrote Verilog like this, that's exactly what would happen. right? When you change the value of x, <coughs> y changes automatically. Um, but that's not how C works. That's not how most of the languages that we will be studying, C, Java, and so on, um, are strictly go statement by statement by statement. But that's, that's a sometimes subtle point. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so we talked through this last time, and, and most of the variables we dealt with are either integers or real numbers, and most of the reals we're dealing with are doubles. So we've, we've already seen input and output for integers. They're both percent i. Um, doubles, remember if you're doing input with scanf, you need to use lf, not just f. You can use f for output. Um, and characters are just percent %c, but we haven't really done anything with characters. Um, and then later in this course, you're going to get into strings, and that's where things will get even more interesting. But um, if you understand integers and doubles, printf and scanf, you're in good shape on those. So, um, I want to start expanding 
our understanding of programming in C a little bit. I want to get into some new constructs. Um, but let's back up for a minute um, and do a bit of a bigger picture analysis. Um, I'm sitting here on my laptop and this is a terminal window, right? This is like the window you would see if you used PuTTY to connect to the CTEC server. Well, in fact, let's just go to the CTEC server. All right, so there's the CTEC server. And this is sitting here waiting for me to type something and I can type, you know, ls and it'll show me what's in my directory and so on and so forth. Um, I can type a funny sounding command called ps space dash elf and this will show me a whole bunch of stuff all of these each line of this corresponds to some program that is running on the machine right now the ctech server okay something called a knit which has been running for a long time since january 6th um, something called apache which has been running since july 17th apache is the thing that serves up web pages if you have a web page on the CTEC server and you point your browser to it, you're talking to um, Apache to make that happen. Um, and somewhere down here, there's someone editing program two. Um, and we can read new usernames in here. We can see who's logged in, right? Someone did an SSH and connected to the server there. Um, so I'm editing P1, and down here is somebody running a command called PS. Hey, that's me, right? And that was running while this program was running that said, show me everything that's sitting, that's running on this machine right now. Um, and so this is a lot of stuff going on, right? Most of these programs that are running were written in C. Okay, you can find the source code for them. Um, and it's, it's a whole bunch of processes running at the same time. And if you use the command top, it'll show you the, the top few processes that are running right now, plus some other information. So on the top, it tells us the machine has been up for 193 days and 15 hours. Okay, that's the time since the last reboot. Unix systems don't usually get rebooted unless there's a reason where some major change to the system has occurred and it's so major that you need to restart the whole system. Um, this is typically some kind of really bad bug that's been discovered um, and you can't just repair it in place. You have to make some changes and reboot. But other than that, Unix systems run. I mean, they'll stay up for years in some cases um, and they don't get slower as they stay booted for longer and longer. They're pretty clean. Um, so this has been running for, you know, more than half a year now. Um, 15 users, that's the number of people who are actually logged in. Load average is a measure of how busy the machine is. A load average of 0 0.02 is really, really small. Okay, load average of 5, you're going to start to see things slowing down. 10, it's definitely going to be slow, but it's relative, right? And it's like current, last minute, and last 5 minutes, or something like that, those three numbers. Um, but tasks, 198 total tasks. Okay, the PS Elf, 198 things. Only one of those tasks was running. 196 of them were sleeping. One was stopped. There were no zombies. Sometimes you get zombies on your system. It's when you kill a process, but it doesn't actually die. It still walks around. It's called a zombie. Um, and so there's, there's various information about this. Um, and this program called Top, that's another C program, right? Um, So, here's a shorter version of PS. If you just say PS, it just shows you the processes associated with you. So I've got two processes associated with me. One is called bash, the other is called PS. Right, well PS is the command I just typed, PS. What is bash? Bash is the program that is running right now 
that just printed out N Macias at CTEC colon tilde dollar sign and is now waiting for me to type something in. And when I type PWD and hit enter, it will say, what did you type in? It'll do something like a scanf. It'll get the characters that I typed and it'll say, oh, you typed a P followed by a W by a D. Oh, you want to know what directory you're in? And it will look inside itself and figure out what directory I'm in and print that out and then print the prompt and so on. Bash is another C program. And for me right now, Bash is always running, okay, until I log out. If you do a PSELF at the bottom, we saw Bash listed. If I log out, that'll go away. So there's always programs running on the system. Um, But there's one other thing happening on this system. There's this notion of an operating system or an OS. Okay, so on, on a laptop, typically you're running Windows or maybe OS X if you have a Mac, um, or maybe Linux, right? So I'm running Linux. Um, a Windows PC will be running Windows. Um, operating systems are basically the things that let you run other programs. They do things like manage access to the disk. Uh, control access to the printer or to the web and so on and so forth and your programs use the operating system to do those things right if I want to send something to the printer I don't talk directly to the printer I talk to some part of the operating system all right so at the top level we've got the operating system and underneath that we've got processes and those processes are C programs and in this course, that's kind of where we kick in, is this idea of, of a C program. Um, so our A dot out, for example. p1.c and I get this a dot out right, which we looked at before and it was it was hard for us to read we can read a little bit of it though right down here at the bottom we recognize that that was part of our program we were playing around with modifying percent f but the bulk of this is weird it always says all from the beginning though that's one of the ways that the system knows this is a program file that's supposed to be executed um, but most of it's just internal code. Um, so we we drew this picture before p1.c and we run gcc and we get an a dot out and then this thing somehow gets run right for us we just say dot slash a dot out and it executes so how many people have taken apart their computer so what's inside a lot of things, a lot of things. okay what are some of the things motherboard, motherboard. What else? Hard drive. Hard drive. Solid state. Lots of wires. Yeah. What? Graphics. Oh uh, yeah, GPU. Yeah. I don't have a GPU, but mine's built in on the motherboard because I have a cheap PC. <laughs> oh what? Power, Power supply, <laughs> definitely. Hopefully some fans, <laughs> or if you're lucky, maybe liquid cooling. You get disk drive? Yeah, so hard drive. Oh, uh, oh like DVD drive. could be other drives. USB buses. 
maybe a floppy. <laughs> Probably not. Um, USB buses or other kinds of buses. Um, and this all kind of works magically, right? Um, and the motherboard kind of like pulls all these things together. More and more the motherboard is a whole bunch of connectors and you just plug things in, right? So you've got your external drive, there's a cable from that, it plugs into somewhere on the motherboard. You've got your optical drive, that plugs in somewhere, your power supply plugs in and so on. Um, the CPU tends to be on the motherboard, right? Um, so what is the CPU? What does that do? What does CPU stand for? Central processing unit. Um, that sounds pretty legit. Um, and then GPU is graphics processing unit. So what's the CPU do? What's the life of a CPU? Sidebar, how many people have seen Tron? Anybody see the original? Cool. I haven't seen the reboot. But, um. So central processing unit. Um, this is sometimes called the brains of the computer, right? Um, it's the part of the computer that's doing the calculations. If you're adding and stuff like that, that's happening inside the CPU. Um, if you're moving a bunch of stuff around between different spots in memory, or you're moving stuff from memory to the floppy drive, or from the floppy <coughs> drive to the network card, or things like that, that's usually being done by the CPU. It's sending commands to the floppy drive or the hard drive and saying, give me this information. And then it talks to the network card and says, here's some information, send it over there. Right? <coughs> um, and how does the CPU know what it's supposed to do? If it can do all these different things, how does it decide what to do at any given moment? It prioritizes things somewhat. But where does it get its its orders from for the things it should prioritize? Say again? Um, ultimately something like switches. Transistors. Partially from the operating system. Okay, so we're getting we're getting down to um, to a picture. Um, so one of the things that you said was inside the computer was memory. And memory is used to store, you know, numbers and characters and pictures and things like that, data, web pages, and so on. So the CPU wants to be able to read and write memory. Um, but one of the things stored in memory are instructions for the CPU, right? So programs. Um, so the memory contains data plus code. And this wasn't always the case. The very first electronic general purpose computers that were developed in the 30s, um, and we're thinking like Univac, um, these computers had CPUs, which could do addition and moving and comparing and so on. It had memories for storing data, but the code was not stored in memory. To write a program for the CPU, you actually took a bunch of cables and plugged them into different holes, and you set knobs to different settings, and this was how you programmed the computer. If you wanted it to calculate angles for firing a cannonball to hit a target with a certain crosswind, you change the physical configuration of these plugs and these knobs and these wires 
and then you ran the program and it would, you know, read memory and update results and so on and so forth. But your program was physical, right? It was, it was fixed and to change the program you had to physically change the configuration of this hardware. Um, so the idea of software didn't exist, right? It was all hardware. Um, when when um, von Neumann and um, other people decided it would be really useful to put the code, the program, inside the memory, right? Now we have the idea of software. It's part of the hardware, but it's malleable. It's soft. It can be changed without having to go in and physically, you know, change wires and stuff. Um, and this is collectively called a stored program computer. The program is stored in memory, right? And that's, that's a brilliant advancement beyond the first version where everything was hardwired. Um, because we can do things like download programs from the web, right? If we didn't have this, you'd have to download a program. Somebody would have to pop out of the display and come over with a screwdriver and start changing your hardware for you to load the new program in, right? Um, so, so this is this is taken for granted today, but it's not an automatic. Um, so when we write programs in C and we compile them and we turn them into this a dot out and then we say dot slash a dot out what happens all of this code that's inside a dot out somehow gets loaded into some part of this memory and then something in the operating system tells the CPU so so we take a dot out and we load it into say this part of the memory right here and then something tells the CPU, okay, I want you to start executing instructions from memory, starting with this instruction right here. And it basically looks at the first instruction of your program and it starts executing. And that return zero you put at the end of your program will, when that instruction gets executed, the CPU will go back to wherever it was just before you started executing your program. It basically returns the operating system to doing what it was doing before you said A dot out. So all of this stuff lives in the same space and it all sort of works and plays together. And, um, and that's important. So here's a program called a dot out, and I don't have a return zero at the end. And this is a case where I needed to have a return statement, and I don't. And I can say, you know, print working directory or list or GCC or help, and nothing is working, right? I haven't gone back to the operating system. My program is running right now, and it's pre pretty much going to run forever unless I do something. And do a top, A dot out has 99.7% of the CPU right now. <laughs> That's not a problem. If somebody else was trying to do something, it would split equally with them. But nothing else is happening in particular right now. So A dot out has almost all the CPU right now. It's just chewing up CPU cycles. Um, All right, so does anybody remember how to deal with a program that is running and won't stop? Control C. Control C, good. So hold down Control and press C, that terminates your program. And now if I, if I look at top, um, A dot out is not up there anymore. So even though a dot out was running, right? That was my program doing its thing. Um, control C is a special combination of keys. It's something the operating system picks up. 
And when the operating system sees that you hit control C, it sends a request to something that says basically interrupt this program that's running. And so it prints out a control C and it terminates the program and now we're back at the operating system. So if you're running a program and it's not working, you can also just disconnect from the server. Right? You can just close PuTTY if you're using PuTTY and start a new PuTTY session. And that will get you back to where you can type commands and edit your code and so on and so forth. But you don't really want to do that unless you absolutely have to. Because there's, there's kind of a limit to how many times you can do that. Um, So pretend I just closed out my putty session, right? And now I'm logging back in. Um, but if I look, that A dot out is still running. And I can't control C it, because it's not running from here. This is a new putty session. My old putty session, I closed out putty or I rebooted my laptop or something. This thing is just sitting there running. And it's, it's you know, taking some CPU time. If I do this 20 times, it's going to pull down the system. It's not going to let me do it 20 times, though. What's going to happen is after I do this a few times, it's going to say, effectively, you've got too many processes going, and it's not going to let me log in. And then you got to like send an email to somebody and say, hey, I can't get logged in, and they'll get rid of these old processes for you. Now, since this is my process, A dot out, and I'm, you know, nmacius, and the user for a dot out is nmacius. I can kill this process myself. I can say kill um, three zero nine six one. That's this process ID right here, and that may or may not work. All right, so that process is gone. Sometimes it's harder to kill processes, even the ones you own. All right, so if you want to stop your program, use control C. Um, same thing with your NVI. Remember we talked last time, if you're NVI, exit VI when you're done. Right, either colon Q or colon X or something. Um, to put it away. And And don't do control Z, because control Z is not the same as control C. All right, control Z stops it. It's no longer taking a lot of CPU time, but it's still hanging out there. Okay, and it looks like it did what I want because now I can type commands and stuff, but control Z doesn't actually kill your process. It just kind of pauses it. And if I log out now and I do this multiple times, I might end up running out of places to have processes. So stick with control C. All right, so that's, that's just kind of sidebar stuff. Let me go back on my own machine. Hey, we were playing around with this code last time, your program too, so we got as far as as putting in the number of drinks, I believe. Yeah. Oh, we did drinks and oranges. No, we just did drinks. We faked it for oranges. Um. All right, so how many drinks would you like? Four, and so tells us four drinks. So let me take out this fake orange code. Seven fifty, forty nine cents tax, seven ninety nine. 
All right, so for program two, this is all you need. You need to do it for, for the three types of items. Um, yeah? How critical is it if my tax on energy drinks is like a penny off? Uh, how so? It's a, it's a rounding thing, I think. Are you rounding or not rounding? I'm not rounding. Or no, it, it does round, but it's rounding. I don't, I don't know why it's rounding. So it anything too bad. Yeah, so he says not to worry about rounding. Um, don't worry about rounding errors. Um, and I think what you're supposed to do is just let it round however it decides to round. I, yeah, and that's kind of what so, I did. So, what did you try the example mm -hmm. from here? Specifically, yeah, like, instead of 19 cents, it's 20 cents. But you got 19, did your program say 19 cents or 20 cents? What, it's a penny, I think, over. It's a penny different from what this says? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, Show me at the break. Okay. Let's just see what you're doing. I think it's probably sure. okay, um, but there there might be something that you're doing with integers or, or doubles okay. mixed together. Sure. But yeah, probably not an issue. So one of the weird things in here is if you say how many drinks would you like, give me negative a hundred. And suddenly the person running the store owes you $159.75, right? So if this was automated, if there wasn't somebody standing there, I could just say I'm buying minus 100 drinks, and it would say, okay, you owe me negative 159, and you gave me zero, so here's your 159 change, right? Um, so you don't need to do any of this for program two, okay? We're going beyond what you need for P2 now. Um, it might be nice to put a check in here and make sure that they ask for a number of drinks that's not negative, right? And if they say, I want negative five drinks, we could do something like say, that's not a legal number of drinks, and we could just exit the program at that point. So up to this point, our program is a series of sequential statements. We set tax rate to 65, we set the cost of one drink, we do some print statements, we do some scan statement, we do a few calculations, and then we do some print statements, and then we return. Okay, so you may never see this again in this course, but you will see it in other CS courses. Um, the idea of a flow chart. And flow charting is a really old way of visually um, representing what you're going to be trying to do in code. Because code, sometimes code is very confusing, right? Assembly language code, horribly confusing. Just looks like gibberish to most people. Um, C code can get terribly confusing at times. Uh, Fortran, that code used to be written in terrible nightmare to follow what's going on. So people would write flow charts and they were visual representations of what your program was going to do. And it's a very simple language. Um, flow charts begin with an oval that says start. This is where our program is beginning. And we and draw a box to do something like tax rate equals 0 0.065 to represent things that we want to have happen. We want some variable called tax rate. We're going to set it to 0 0.065. We can draw these trapezoids if we're going to do input or output. So we might say something like ask how many drinks? And then the next thing we're going to do is somehow read from the user um, number of drinks. And then we're going to do a calculation which says cost equals number of drinks times 1.5 tax equals cost times tax rate 
and total equals cost plus tax. And then one more set of print statements. So print cost, tax, and total. And then we're done. And this is not C code, okay? C code has to be very precise in its format. Semicolons at the end of each line. Um, exact variable names where case matters um, and so on. This is what we sometimes call pseudocode, okay? It's things that look kind of like code but aren't necessarily meant to be read by a compiler. They're meant to be read by a person. And this is a flow chart, right? And the, the understanding is we start with start and we just go wherever the arrows go. But the basic flow is from top to bottom. So we don't usually just put arrows pointing down because it's a lot of arrows, okay? So the program we've written is really just a sequence of steps. And every time we run this program, no matter what we do, these are the steps that are going to take place. Okay, so that's a basic flow chart. Now suppose we want to add this embellishment that says you cannot have a negative number of drinks. So right here, after we read the number of drinks, we'd like to do a check. We'd like to say, is the number of drinks bigger than zero. We won't let them buy zero drinks because they're a weirdo if they do that. So we'll just kick them out of the store. So we want the number of drinks to be bigger than zero. So here's the first embellishment to our flow chart. So we're coming in here and we say read number of drinks. All right, we're going to ask a question now. Is the number of drinks positive? And if it is positive, we're going to go on and we're going to do these calculations and do this print. But if it's not positive, we're going to do something totally different. We're going to print out a message and say that's weird and we're just going to come down here to the end. Okay. So here's how we represent decisions. We draw a diamond. And inside the diamond, we ask a yes-no question. So our yes-no question here might be, is num of drinks bigger than zero? And we got two ways we can leave this diamond. I'm going to label this one yes and this one no. I could put no on the bottom and yes on the side, that's fine. I could put my no coming out of the left instead of the right. It's not a rigorous specification. But the important part is there's a yes no question in that diamond and I have two ways to flow from that diamond. And one is labeled yes, the other no, or maybe true or false. Um, so is number of drinks bigger than zero? And if it is, then I'm just going to flow down here and calculate the cost tax total, print those out, and we're done. If it's not, what am I going to do? I'm going to print something. I'm just going to say goodbye. And then I'm going to come down here. So now we have a program with a conditional statement inside. So we're doing the old stuff we did. Read the number of drinks. How many drinks do you want? Negative five. Is negative five bigger than zero? No. Print goodbye and go down to return. Is the number of drinks bigger than zero? Yes. Calculate the cost, print out the cost, and return. Okay, everybody clear on the idea of this, what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it. And this is the part of programming 
like I said the first day, that is, that's sort of the most challenging part, is figuring this out. Once you know that this is what you want to do, to convert this into C will eventually be very mechanical. It won't take any creativity at all. The creative part is, oh, I'm going to check to see if the number of drinks is bigger than zero. And I'm going to do something like this if it's, if it's not, and so on. And there's different ways to do this. I could say, is the number of drinks less than or equal to zero? And if it is, I'll do this. If it's not, I'll do this. That would be exactly the same behavior, but it's a different yes-no question I'm asking in here. Okay, and everything we do in here, there's always going to be multiple ways to do it, almost certainly. All right. So that's what we want. So we're going to need some new C statements to be able to do this. And so the magic statement we need is called if. It's not surprising. And basically, we're going to say if num of drinks is bigger than zero. We're going to put that question in parentheses, and then we can list some stuff that we want to have happen if that is true. All right, so for starters, I should have done this differently. Let me change this a little bit. Let's say is the number of drinks less than zero. And if it is, we'll say goodbye. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and we'll calculate the cost and stuff. I'll say less than or equal to. OK, exactly the same behavior. Um, but I want to write the code for this, and then we'll write the code for the other way. OK, so let's, let's look at how we can modify this. So where do we ask for the number of drinks? How many drinks would you like scan percent I num of drinks? So let's see if the number of drinks is greater than zero. All right, so my yes no question is, is the number of drinks less than or equal to zero? So if num of drinks, and the symbol for less than or equal is a less than followed by an equal sign. Because we don't have a less than with a little line underneath it. So if number of drinks is less than or equal to zero, and then put a closing parenthesis. And what do we want to do in this case? We want to print out goodbye, and then we want to basically return to whoever called us. We want to end our program. OK, anytime you say if, parentheses, condition, close parentheses, we put a curly bracket. And now we can list whatever we want to do if that if statement was true. And it'll do everything down to a closing curly bracket. So do the following statements. We'll print out that's weird goodbye. And we'll go ahead and do a return. And then a closing bracket. And that's the end of the if statement. Does that look reasonable? Plausible at least? So everything's the same up to the scanning of the number of drinks. But now we're saying, if the number of drinks is less than zero, let's print out goodbye and return. Does it still run through the rest of the program? Once we say return zero, that basically leaves the program. OK, if we didn't say return zero, then it would continue with the rest of the program. And if the number of drinks is not less than or equal to zero, all of this gets skipped. So if number of drinks is 5, it's going to ignore all of the stuff that's highlighted. It's just going to come down and continue with what it was doing before. And usually when we write this, we use some indenting. So since I'm inside a set of curly brackets, I'm going to increase my indent level 
and now if I come in and I look at this, it's pretty easy once you're used to it to see, oh, those two print statement, return statement, those things are inside an if, right? And so if I want to know what's going on while I'm scanning up here, and then I'm doing an if statement, and then I'm going to do a cost and a tax and so on. So should we try this? So how many drinks would you like? Five. Works exactly like before. How many drinks would you like? Negative five. That's weird. Goodbye. Yes. Matter? Doesn't matter. So so you can do that. Perfectly fine. This again gets into like whatever your personal style is. Um, and there was some day decades ago where I just kind of like I don't know if I decided or realized this is how I'm doing if statements and C. <laughs> All right. So discover your style. Uh, in 120, there was, I don't remember the, I think it was MATLAB, mm -hmm. and it required end, so returning zero is basically like end, or does end work different? End was a little different, because end usually went at the end of the whole program, right? Yeah. Um, for us, the actual end is this final curly bracket. Oh, okay. Okay. Return is something which basically says, leave this program that's running right now. Okay. Weird looks weird to me right now. <laughs> it's definitely not that. <laughs> Why weird? All right. Suppose we want to limit our customers to a maximum of 10 energy drinks. I'm not going to let them get too buzzed. So we need number of drinks to be less than or equal to 10. How would that change our flow charge? Or how could we change our flow charge? We could have another diamond underneath zero. Okay. Let's put another diamond underneath here. Because if they say negative five, we're just going to say goodbye. We don't need to check to see if they asked for more than 10 drinks, right? <coughs> so let's put another diamond in here. And what should that diamond ask? Is the number of drinks is less or greater than 10? OK. Is num of drinks greater than 10? And if it's not, no problem. We'll go ahead and we'll calculate how much money they owe. If it is, what should we do? We can just print out that's too many drinks and go to the end of our program. All right, so if the number of drinks is not negative, ask is the number of drinks bigger than 10? And if it's not, just continue as usual. But if it is, let's do something different. Let's print out that's too many drinks, and then we'll just end our program. We'll do our return again. So how do we do that in here? Another if statement. Number 
number we went back to Joe Banks. If the number of drinks is bigger than 10, tell them that's too many drinks and do our return. <coughs> and so I'm indenting this also. I'm not indenting it further than the first one because my if statement started right here. Right? This is this is just another statement that's going to be executed, but my if part is down here. This is the part that's conditionally going to be operated. I indented that some more. I'm also playing around with with uh, vertical spacing, right? Before this if statement, this is a bunch of statements. There's a comment, there's an if, there's two things, there's a closing curly bracket. I threw a blank line right before, just to sort of visually delimit it. Same thing down here, same thing down here. It's totally optional. The compiler does not care about blank lines. I could put it all together, one line right after another. It would take less space, but it might be harder to read, right? And, and after this blank line, I've got a comment saying, what are we doing in this next section of code? Oh, we're seeing if they're asking for too many drinks. Okay, if the number of drinks is bigger than 10, um, print this out and return. And if this was a very complex piece of, of code, I might do something down here like say um, end of um, check for too many drinks. So if the stuff inside the if went on for page after page after page, right, and I was trying to follow this code, it might be hard to know where that ends. Um, so I put a little comment here, this is where I'm done checking to see if they have too many drinks. And that helps me understand what the code's doing. All right, so let's compile that and run that. How many drinks would you like? Five. How many drinks would you like? Negative six. That's still weird. Goodbye. How many drinks would you like? Um, 198. That's too many drinks. And program exits. So ifs are fundamental to programming languages. It's the decision-making part. Right, and this is this is essential for algorithms. You can do one thing after another after another, um, but at some point you need to be able to change your behavior based on something. Usually, the value of a user input, or the presence of some condition, or something like that. Um, and even you know, so my standard analogy for an algorithm is is a recipe, right? Um, even a, a standard recipe has ifs in it, right? If you're making a cake, it's like mix this, mix that, add this in, and it's like if your altitude is above 5,000 feet, do this, otherwise do that, right? These are fundamental. Um, to make a general purpose programming language, we only need three things. We need to be able to execute sequential statements, okay, which we've been doing. We need to be able to do conditionals. We need to be able to change well, whether we do this or that based on some condition, that's the second thing. The third thing we need is to be able to loop, to go back and repeat previous sections of our program. All right, so let's do a five minute break. We'll continue after that.